Several of you have children that came down to join me for the children's sermon today. Uh, how many of you in the past, too, have had children who came down to join me during the children's sermon? How many of you were terrified by that experience? Uh, well, I love having children in the, in the building. And, and what a step of faith it is for you parents to know that I'm carrying a live microphone when it happens. Now, I have long enjoyed children. Children are uh, children just such a treat. Uh, I heard about a little girl. She was standing, waiting for her parents. Parents were visiting. She was ready to go home. And uh, like we, we said, uh, starting to get hungry. It's time for lunch. And she's ready to go. And uh, one of the greeters, an older man in the church, walked over to her. And he said, how are you today? And she said, I'm fine. What are you doing? Waiting for my parents. Oh, okay. Well, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And she said, we learned about, we learned about Jonah and the whale. He said, Really? Do you think that story's true? I mean, that a, that a big old fish could swallow somebody in three days and, and then they're still alive at the end of that? You, you think that's true? And she said, yes, I do. She's a very young girl. She said, yes, I do. Because the Bible says it happened, so I believe it. He said, I don't know about that. Uh, I mean, do, do you think he could prove it? Well, at this point, she's just getting a little irritated with this guy. Uh, patience running a little thin and he said so how would you know how are you going to know if it's true or not and she said well when I get to heaven I'll just ask Jonah <laughs> and he said well what if Jonah's not in heaven she said well then I guess you can ask him <laughs> oh. <laughs> and there you go all right Mark chapter 10 verse 13 is a story that uh, I like to talk about, especially when it gets to be vacation Bible school time. The story from Mark's gospel chapter 10 verse 13 says, And they were bringing children to him, to Jesus, that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, he was angry, and he said to them, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them into his arms and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. What a beautiful picture of Jesus and his heart for that next generation, his heart for children. Now, as parents, as church leaders, as a church ministry, we're supposed to reach out. To everybody, whosoever will may come, but we especially put a focus on children. In Vacation Bible School, well, we do this all year long. Vacation Bible School, we say, is a big exclamation point in a year-long effort to focus our attentions on reaching children for Christ. Children, uh, with so much to teach them, and there's so much they teach us. Uh, before I dive into our text, I had one more thing. It's one of my favorite things ever. It was uh, from a mom just describing things her son had taught her. And there are a lot of instructional things that you find in uh, the words of a mother about what her son can teach. Here's what she said. I've learned you shouldn't toss baseballs up inside when the ceiling fan is on. I've learned that double-pane glass in the window will not stop a baseball that's been hit by a ceiling fan. I've learned that the motor on the ceiling fan isn't strong enough to rotate a 42-pound boy wearing a Superman cape hanging by a dog leash. I've learned that when you hear the toilet flush followed by the words, uh-oh, it's already too late. <laughs> My son has taught me that the spin cycle on a washing machine can make a cat very dizzy. As a side note, I've also learned that a dizzy cat can throw up two to three times its body weight. Mostly, my son has taught me that you can only survive parenthood with a great sense of humor. Uh, now, as we study this scene, this touching scene where Jesus welcomes children into his arms, I want to make four observations about children. Here's the first thing. And this is, this is real understated. It is good for parents to bring their children to Jesus. Is that clear enough? Simple enough? Straightforward enough? It is good for parents to bring their children to Jesus. We read, people were bringing little children to Jesus. These folks bringing their children to Jesus, 
they're not identified. We assume culturally it would have been their parents, it would have been their grandparents, but they wanted to push their children forward to be close to where Jesus was. It is a great privilege as a parent to bring children, encourage children, guide children toward Jesus. It's good. Many of you as grandparents have dived into that role and made it a gospel-focused role. I know that on a big deal week of Vacation Bible School, it's important to a lot of you that your children be a part of Vacation Bible School. It's important to a lot of you that you say, I want my grandchildren to be here to hear the message of the gospel that's going to be presented every day in the classroom. We're going to present it in here in everything that we do on campus. And I, I told the I told our VBS leaders a week or so ago that we just want to focus everything on Jesus. We're not going to back up or back down from the gospel at all times here. That's what we do Vacation Bible School for. And here's the great part. We're going to bring our children. We're going to bring neighbor children. We're going to bring grandchildren. We're going to, we did the whosoever will may come. We're an open door. It's not just only church people can come to Vacation Bible School. The whole community comes. So we'll have a lot of people with a lot of different spiritual backgrounds and a lot of folks with no spiritual background at all that are going to be a part of Vacation Bible School. Here's what's going to happen this week. Eternal destinies are going to change because of Vacation Bible School. How amazing is that? Now, it's important for parents and grandparents to bring their children to, to church, to bring them to Jesus, to hear the spiritual truths of God's Word, to be trained from the earliest ages. And, and it's rare, but I have run into it. I've been doing ministry for a long time now, and I, everywhere I have served and here as recently as last week, I've had this conversation. Where someone says, well, I, I mean, I want my kids to know God and everything, but I don't want to influence them. I want, I want it really to be their decision, that they'll, they'll just discover it for themselves. I want to give them a lot of opportunity to do whatever they want to, to, to learn in, in any ways they want, grow up exposed to different ways of thinking about it. And then when they're old enough, they can decide for themselves. And uh, I just want to tell you, you would never do that with their education. You would never do that with their health care. Why would you do that with their eternal soul? This is so vitally important. You want to engage at a high level when it comes to guiding your children toward Jesus. Uh, I had a story years ago. It was two fathers, and they were discussing how to raise kids. And they got into this, this topic, and, and they found themselves on opposite ends of it. One of them said, I, really, I think it's my responsibility to guide my children to Jesus, to steer the, steer the ship in that direction. I, I want to I put them in environments. I want to put them on a path that's going to give them the greatest possible opportunity to come to know Jesus and to know Jesus at the earliest possible age. The other father, he took the other route. Well, I don't, I don't want to cram religion down their throat. I want them to decide for themselves. I want them to make up their own minds. I, I don't want to influence them in that way because I want it to be their decision, not just something I pushed on them. And they went back and forth, and they could tell they weren't, they weren't, they weren't neither one was going to change their position. It was getting a little tense. And so the guy who said, I really should, I, I want to encourage my kids toward Christ, he said, well, Okay, let's shift gears. I want you to see my garden out in the backyard. You got to see my garden. And they walked around the backyard. He said, back there in that back corner, that's my garden. The guy looked at him. He said, that's, that is no garden. It's, it's just, it's overgrown with weeds and thorns and thistles. It was just a mess back there in that corner. And he said, that, I'm no professional gardener, but that is no garden. I'll tell you right now. And he said, well, see, the thing is, I I don't want to be influencing the soil in some certain direction. I don't want to influence it with putting any kind of particular seeds out there. I just want the garden to develop as it sees fit. The other father said, point made. Now, there's a powerful promise found in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. That's a, that's a verse that sometimes gets cloudy for a lot of people. They, they think, well, as long as they get some exposure early in life, it doesn't matter, it make any difference what happens between here and there. They're going to be okay uh, forever. They may drift away from God for decades, but maybe when they're 70, they'll say, oh, yeah, I need to go back to church again. And a lot of different ways it's interpreted and misinterpreted uh, over time. Some people think, well, maybe if I indoctrinate my kids properly, correctly, uh, 
they'll, they'll get it. Some people say train means to just make it a stern discipline. You're just going to beat them over the head with the Bible till they can't turn back anymore. Give them a lot of memorizations and lots of rules and regulations. Legalism. Uh, making uh, spiritual training at the, in the home like basic training in the military. Well, this word train is a, is a beautiful word in the Hebrew language. Uh, this is, and you find it used in other contexts, and that's when you learn kind of the depth of some of these words. It's not just what it means, but how it is used in other contexts than, than here, train up a child in the way he should go. The word train also shows up with Hebrew midwives. And in, in Hebrew literature, you find this word, and the word train is used to describe the work of the midwives. And one of the things that they would do is they would, they would take the fingers... And they'd mix it together, some mixture of sweet, crushed dates and uh, fruit dates and uh, olive oil. They'd mix it together and they'd take that mixture and they'd rub it on the palate of a newborn infant. And it created uh, uh, kind of a trigger to get that sucking uh, instinct kicking in so that they were, they, were, they, they were desiring nourishment. They were ready to nurse. And that's... Train is the word they use to describe that process. And what does it mean to train up a child? It means to create a spiritual hunger in them. To create an environment where they are drawn to want to know the Lord. Want to follow the Lord. And, and to, to build as many things into that lifestyle as you can. To, to create a desire that they would know God, love God, serve God. And when you create that kind of desire in them... When they're old, they won't depart from it. They'll still be desiring. They'll still be hungering for the word of God. Jesus also, second, warns against hindering children from approaching him. This is a big, big part of what we want to talk about today. You know, as parents were bringing their children to Jesus, the disciples started acting like security guards. They, Jesus has more important things to do than to deal with a bunch of kids. And so we're going we're gonna to be the security. We're going to push them back. Uh, get them out of the way. And before we're too hard on, and by the way, Jesus became angry. The, and the experiences we have in the scriptures and the gospels where we find Jesus becoming angry, the reason he becomes angry is because somebody is keeping other people from God. Somebody is pushing folks away from the Lord, and Jesus will have none of it. And this is children. He's very sensitive in this particular area. And before you, you just beat down the disciples, I mean, they do a lot of dumb stuff, like we do a lot of dumb stuff. But here's the thing about the disciples. We learn uh, in verse 1 that they'd crossed over to the other side of Jordan. We learn from the, comparing the other Gospels that they're in the land of Perea. So the land of Perea they've transitioned into is a predominantly Gentile area. So these aren't just children, they're also Gentile children. And for the disciples, they just started thinking... Well, this just can't be that important. Uh, Jesus can't waste his time with these kids. And they turned out to be really, really wrong. During the first century, we, we have preserved for us a papyrus letter. Papyrus is a reed, and they, they could take it, roll it out, dry it out, and crisscross it, and they could make an early form of paper. And some of this papyrus, as fragile as, as it was, has survived into the current time. Well, in the first century, time of Jesus, there's a letter written by a Roman soldier to his wife, and it's on a papyrus document, and it's uh, in a museum in Rome, and this is, this is uh, what it says. It says, if our child, the soldier writing to his wife, if our child is a son, keep him, but if our child is female, throw it away. And, and we live in an age of throwaway kids. And it's one of the, one of the great uh, losses in our land and one of the great dark places in the heart of our country. And, but Jesus loves the little children, even those no one else cares about. Even if they're the Gentile children, Jesus loves the little children. In the previous chapter, back in chapter 9, Jesus warned about hindering a child from coming to him. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. The, the, the word he's using for millstone is 
a stone that would weigh close to a ton. It was used to grind, uh, grind out olives and to make olive oil. Super heavy. And Jesus said, someone who, who's pushing a child away from God, it'd be better for him to have one of those one-ton millstones just wrapped around his neck and have him thrown into the sea. It'd be better for him to not be living than to be doing that. You know, I shudder every time I hear stories. And in uh, Dallas Morning News yesterday, there were stories about people in, in our world. And, and sometimes these things happen right here in uh, good old North Texas where people are abusing children, misusing children. Whether it's sex trafficking, it's a drug trafficking, utilizing children, creating a dark, dark place for young hearts. And I think God must reserve the hottest places in hell for adults who would use and abuse children. And so there's a big population of that. But here's, here's the part I want to focus in on today. Sometimes parents can be stumbling blocks to their own children coming toward Jesus. Sometimes parents don't want their children going to church and learning about the Bible. And every year in Vacation Bible School, we'll follow up with people who indicate they're unchurched. And as we follow up with folks after Vacation Bible School, and this, this year during the week of Vacation Bible School, as children are hearing, dozens of them are going to make commitments to Christ, take a big next step toward Jesus. And we contact parents about those decisions. Again, it's not just... Here and now, this has been going on for a lot of years. We contact a parent and say, your child said, I would like to follow Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And they say, we don't want any part of that. Uh, we don't need to do that. That's not a part of our family uh, goals. Partly because it would require the parents to have to do something with God too. And they don't want any part of that. But I can recall so many stories of children excited about their decisions for Christ and their parents just put up roadblocks that wouldn't permit them to take a next step, to follow through on that commitment. And that's a heartbreaker for me. Other parents, other parents want their children to know and love Jesus. And they're excited, maybe in a week of vacation Bible school, somewhere along the way, early in life, they say yes to Jesus. But then parents start filling their lives with so many other things. And there are a lot of enrichment opportunities in our area, and it's great to give them those opportunities. But here's what can happen. A parent, a well-meaning parent with a child that's made a commitment to Christ, you can fill their lives with so many other things that what you create is the thorny soil in the parable of the sower. And it chokes out the spiritual life uh, that is developing in the life of a child. And I want you to love your kids, but listen, you can put them in a thousand and one things, but if you're keeping them from Jesus and their eternal soul is at stake, you just need to change how you're doing it. And I'm going to keep on telling you this, even though I am a voice crying in the wilderness on this. Because there are a lot of other voices that are going to tell you otherwise. But nobody else is caring about their eternal soul. So we're going to keep on saying, don't, don't you create thorny ground for the spiritual life of your child. It's a well-meaning parent most often that keeps their child from Christ. The rise of, of those that... Our surveys are saying, are the N-O-N-E-S, nuns, the people who, the young adults who say, hey, I, I, I'm not a part of any religion, I don't want any religion, I don't need any, any kind of religious spiritual background at all, I'm stepping away from it. Why are they developing? As we continue to do the research and continue to interview them and ask them, tell us why. It's not because of anything church has done. It's because they say, it wasn't important to my parents. Because my parents didn't really care. They, the, they're always watching. And they always see. And they know what's important to us. And it's most closely tied to what's important and unimportant to parents. To your influence as a grandparent. We've got to get this right. Whether you're a parent, a grandparent, a teacher. Children are always watching you. And the way that we live, the what we say, what we do. It influences them either toward the Lord. Or it repels them from the Lord. R.L. Sharp wrote uh, a poem. He said, Isn't it strange that princes and kings and clowns that caper in sawdust rings and common folks like you and me are the builders of eternity? To each is given a bag of tools, a shapeless mass, and a book of rules. And each must make ere time is flown 
a stumbling block or a stepping stone? And there's the big question. Are we going to be a stumbling block or are we going to be a stepping stone to Jesus? Here's the third thing. This is why it's so important that we, and we put so much effort and resource and giftedness into Vacation Bible School because it's easier to come to Christ as a child. Because the harvest is easier and more productive at this stage of life. So the best time for a person to come to Jesus is as a child. And we're glad for anybody and everybody. And we're sharing with a lot of adults right now in, in the focus of our church and evangelism. But we're going to really go all in for children. And I'm all, often asked, how old should a child be to accept Christ? And there, there's some markers there. There's some make-believe things that we do as families that you want that out of the way. And you want the reality of God lifted up high. But there, there's a dividing line that until the make-believe side of some things is out of the way, they're not quite ready yet developmentally. And that's a, one objective measure. But ultimately, it's when they recognize they have sinned. And it's not just, uh-oh, sometimes I do bad things. It's they recognize, and it's created a distance, a separation between me and God. And there's a sense of shame about it. And there's a sense of conviction about it. Uh, th this isn't a biblical term. There's a whole lot of controversy around it. But we sometimes talk about an age of accountability, a time when you're, you're accountable to God for your sin. And... You know, kids grew up in church, and we wanted to immerse them in the gospel and in the Jesus story uh, early, early on. And they're going to, I want Jesus in my heart. I love Jesus, and that's, and that's awesome. We're going to talk about how much God loves them. We're going to talk about sin and, and what disappointing God is and what saying, here's God's design, and here's my plan. And I want to get to God's design and give up on my plan because it's not working. But children are sinners. You're a little precious. I mean, you know, you, we love our kids. But sometimes we build so much insulation around them that they can do no wrong. Uh, you, you'll take on the teachers at school and everybody else arguing that my little precious could never do wrong. You know, your little precious is a sinner and needs a Savior. We all are sinners and need a Savior. And children are born selfish. They'll grab all the toys. They're born rebellious. They learn to say no early on. And that's just them playing to, into that... That disposition, that inclination towards sin that we're born with. So we say, you know, a child that's really, really young, uh, uh, infant, a toddler, they, I, I say, biblically, they're safe. And that means that a child, an, an infant, a young child who dies, uh, they're going to go straight to heaven because... Take this from King David's infant son who died, 2 Samuel. And this is what, when his son died as a, as a newborn, here's what David said. I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. That I'm going to see him again in heaven. He's not coming back. He, he's, he, he died, but I'll see him again. And that God uh, carried that child on to heaven. So... Once a child reaches an age, and it's different, and this is the part, it's different for everybody. There's not a marker. Some, some group, well, when they're 12 years old, then they need to make a decision. Man, there's a lot of knowing you're a sinner and need a Savior before you get to 12 years old for most people. It's a different age for different people. But there comes a time, and sometimes, you know, around, we found, and this isn't a rule of any kind, but around eight years old, that's when a lot of that make believe and what's real starts to get sorted out in their hearts. And they cross a line, and they, are, they, they know what sin is, and they choose to disobey God. And the best time for a child to give their life to Christ is as soon as they understand that they're a sinner that needs a Savior, and early in life. The easiest time for people to come to Christ is when they're children. It's because, and I'll talk about that in the next uh, outline point, but uh, George Barna did a survey uh, a few years back extensive survey and asked based on a biblical definition of when people came to Christ not cultural Christianity like when did you become a Christian well I was confirmed when I was 12 years old oh, I was baptized when I was an infant now that's it's a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that's the only kind of saved you find in the Bible so that's where we focus our energies here and so they got a good biblical definition of these people have made a commitment to Christ when did you do it in the United States of America 50% of Christians Come to know the Lord before the age of 13. 
50% of all those who will ever come to Christ do it before the age of 13. 64% come to know Christ before the age of 18. 77% of all those who name the name of Christ in our country come to Christ before age 21. Only 23% of Christians in the United States come to Christ after the age of 21. It's important when the, when the harvest is so available and so uh, accessible, we need to take full advantage. Parents, grandparents, if you have children in your family who are in that 7, 8, 9, 10 years old, I encourage you, share the gospel with them often and freely. Give them every opportunity to be immersed in the good news of Jesus' story because it will never be easier for them to take a step of trust toward Christ and be saved than it is right now. Fourth thing, to enter Christ's kingdom, God's kingdom, you need to, you need to think like a child in some ways. Not be childish, but to be childlike. Now, some of you today, you came in, you say, well, I'm not a parent, I'm not a child. Does any of this really relate to me directly? And what is God's word for me today? Well, here it is. The only way anyone of any age can come to faith in Christ, can receive his forgiveness, can enter into his kingdom, is as a child. So let me mention just three characteristics. This is the beginning and end of this discussion, but three characteristics that kind of position a child to be maybe more open to the gospel and it's also true for every adult it has to position our heart to be open to the gospel the first is just having a sense of awe and wonder the otherworldliness of god the god that is king of kings lord of lords creator of the universe the, the longer we live the more we lose a sense of awe and wonder we, we well i have it all figured out i have definitions i i have uh understanding and I'm not I'm not amazed by much anymore as you get older that's the way that works uh, we talk about amazing grace but we say I'm not that amazed by grace it's commonplace I've heard the story so many times and we become insulated and isolated from the gospel well it should not be I I, I remember the first Christian song I ever learned to sing and we sang it earlier and I, I, have, I have a degree from a Baptist uh, college and a degree from a Baptist seminary. And I have spent, and I have a couple thousand books that I have read related to my continuing education. And in all of that, I still have never found anything that was more life-changing and more profound than Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Here's the second thing. Children have uh, the ability to trust. A simple trust is necessary if you're going to make a commitment of your life to Christ. We, we make things so complicated. Theology is way deep, but deep theology doesn't save. We're saved by grace through faith. And the simple trust that what Jesus did at the cross and the resurrection has paid our debt for sin. And we invest there our complete faith and trust and commitment. And saving faith is simple. In uh, our first steps class, our, our membership class, I share the gospel. You know, how the, the method I use to share the gospel? It's the same one I use when parents bring their children in to sit with me, young children, to visit about the gospel. The gospel is the same everywhere, and it is simple. It's not this horribly complicated, difficult thing. The gospel is simple. And I share it with adults the same way I share it with children. You have to have a simple trust in God. And children, they just trust. They, they trust that mom and dad are going to take care of me. Um, everything's going to, I'm going to have food to eat. And I'm going to have clothes to wear. And it's all going to work out. And I, I'm just going to trust my parents. And we trust God. We learn to trust God that, He's going to take care of us, and he's going to take care of our eternity, and he's going to take care of our sin problem. He has all those things in his hands, and he's going to carry them forward to his glory. Simple trust. Then the third thing about children relates to forgiveness. Now, as adults, oh, it, when we're injured, when we are wronged, we love to keep score, and we like to hold grudges, and we remember, and we don't let go of things easily. And we don't forgive others easily. 
but we don't accept forgiveness easily either. And as an adult, teenagers, an older person, you know, children, you can see them, they'll, they'll be fighting each other and then they'll, they'll be playing two minutes later. That, that they let go easily. They don't hold on to things. And as adults, we tend to, we tend to, not, to not forgive easily and we tend to not receive forgiveness easily. And we have to sometimes have to ask ourselves, God, could you help me to think more like a child, to have more of a childlike heart? When it comes to, when it comes to my own sin and need for forgiveness and when it comes to my need to forgive others because we'll be forgiven as we forgive others, Jesus said multiple times. Now, children, if you have ever been to Disney World or Disneyland, you're familiar with the ride and the song, It's a Small World. Uh, before it appeared in Disney Parks, it first showed up in the New York World's Fair in 1964. There, it had a different name. It was called Children of the World. And in that exhibit, you went through and you heard at the same time national anthems from multiple countries. And Disney saw this whole thing, but he wasn't too excited about the national anthems all playing. He, he liked the concept, but it had to be different. And so he, he asked the Sherman brothers, who wrote a lot of things for Disney, write a song, a, a happy song, though, about children. And It's a Small World is what came out of that. And it's a Small World is a great song because it's a brain worm, uh, because it digs into you, and once you hear, and, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I thought about this uh, Monday, and I've been singing this song all week, and I would like to share that joy with you, <laughs> of uh, you singing it all week now. It's a small world after all, it's a small world after all. And Disney changed the whole exhibit just to fit the song. And Disney claims it's the most sung, most translated uh, song in history. And I guess it's not the worst thing to have stuck in your brain. There are plenty of other, other songs that would be worse to have stuck in your brain. But it's a small world when it comes to God's world. And God loves everybody, but He especially seems to have a heart for children. And children have always been interested in God. They are inclined toward it. They have a heart that is wide open, looking for God as God looks for them. So this week, here's what we're going to do at First Baptist Church Allen. We are going to throw ourselves in to ministering to children and their families with great abandon. And we're going to pray, and we're going to share, and we're going to love, and we're going to reach out, and we're going to see God do great things. And I appreciate your heart for reaching children, because here's what happens in Vacation Bible School. During a week of Vacation Bible School, we're going to scuff up walls. We're going to spill things on carpet. We're going to have all kinds of adventures because children are going to be all over this place. And at the end, of the, we're also going to see God do some great eternal things. We're going to see children who give their lives to Jesus Christ this week. And we're going to see families who, who are reached and ministered to because of our efforts and they're going to be volunteers who jump in and say, I can do a week of vacation Bible school. And they're going to discover, God's gifted me in some ways. They're going to carry over way beyond a week of vacation Bible school. And you're going to take up service and ministry at a whole new level. And we're going to all know at the end of this week that Jesus loves the little children. And she lo he loves us big children too. Because that's the nature of our Savior. Pray for Vacation Bible School. Pray for God to do great things. Pray that we will go all in. Pray about where you can connect with this. And maybe it's during the week. Maybe it's because of work schedules. You can come out though on Thursday night and just help us to reach out and interact with people during the carnival. Pray that God would do great eternal things in us, through us, to His glory. And to God be the glory. Because I'm anticipating great things he will do.